I am Paul Yeager. This is December 19, 2022, and this is an archive of Iowa Broadcasting Oral History. Today, uh, Brad Oak at WHO TV 13 in Des Moines, Iowa, is our guest chief engineer since 1993. Today's uh, episode is produced by Cliff Brockman, and Randy Schumacher is helping uh, with the camera here at the studio. That Brad, you moved into this building Labor Day 1982. We'll get to that in a moment. When did you start at WHO? I started at May 16th, 1978 as a summer relief master control operator in the old building at 1100 Walnut. Summer relief has <clears throat> just made me laugh because that's a term that is out of fashion now. Yep. That doesn't exist. No, uh, and the term master control operator is becoming uh, extinct as well. But um, at that point in time, you had a bunch of, we, I think we had eight master control operators at that point in time. And we weren't even on the air 24 hours a day. We were, or we were on the air from, I don't know, probably 6 a.m. until uh, midnight at the latest, maybe 11.30 on some nights. And most of the guys took uh, vacation in the summertime and it put a strain on the staff and so they hired summer relief people. I, I, and I know camera operators the same way, networks would do the same mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but how did you get to WHO from, from North Central Iowa to here? Uh, I went to school at Iowa State. I thought I was going to be an electrical engineer and moved into Friley, a wonderful place. And one of the people on the floor, actually a couple of people on, on the floor uh, Meeker House um, were involved with the uh, student run radio station downstairs in the basement. Uh, at that time, KPGY, and I think now it's KUSR, I think, or so something to that effect. And it seemed like a uh, interesting place to hang out, so I started hanging out down at KPGY and got involved in the engineering department. And um, the one guy on the floor who worked down at KPGY, or volunteered down at KPGY, he had been a summer relief uh, master control operator for a couple years prior to that, Dave Ashmore, and I, he, he said something about they needed another one, and I had just probably at that time reached the end of my farming career up, up north central Iowa, and decided that that sounded like kind of a fun thing to do got my FCC license, which you had to have at that point in time, and um, came down here and never left. Funny when you say your, your farm career ending. That's what you and I had bonded on years ago was, was agriculture. Why not farming? Well, I was a town kid, and so my family really didn't have any land, and there wasn't a, there wasn't a path there. I had a passion for it, uh, still do. I still go up and, uh, Lord willing, and um, the season's right, I still go up and drive tractor and once in a while drive truck uh, for the son and grandsons of the gentleman that I was working for in, oh, I think I started with Bob in probably like 71, 72, and worked a couple of years after school or while I was while I was coming down to Ames, go up in the summertime and even on weekends, and um, so yeah, there, there's a, an enjoyment of being out on the farm, but still an enjoyment of Iowa, and and yeah. you understand the importance of communication and a good signal, and you have to be able to get the radio or the TV signal at wherever the home may be. Uh, in 1978, when you start uh, down on Walnut, tell me what the station was like and some of the equipment that was being used? Um, when I started, we had, in Master Control, we had two film chains, uh, RCA TP66 projectors, and uh, forget the, the uh, TP7 slide projector, and TP, I, I don't remember all of the numbers, but um, two film chains, they each had two film projectors and a slide projector. And we had two two-inch quad uh, tape machines, and at that point we were running all the commercials off from an ACR 25 tape machine, which was also two-inch quad in cassettes. 
and um, that was that was it. That was what we did. And so we would run off from the film chains. We would run a lot of the syndicated programming off the film chains. Uh, Bonanza was on film, and Adam Twelve was on film, and um, then News was also shooting the majority of their stuff on film still at that point, and uh, so they would bring in reels before the newscasts, and we would put those up, a reel and a b roll on the on different uh, islands. So we would, and then we were also running a fair amount of commercials off from film. So. News time was a busy time. We had a, we had a master control operator and a projectionist and a tape operator through the mid part of the day. I think a uh, tape operator would come in at 7 and then we were three deep through um, 10.30 and at 10.30 one person would go home and the other person would go home at 11, 11.30, and then one person would stay until sign off at whatever time that was. It was a big operation. It was a big operation. We had, like I said, eight people in master control. Uh, a couple of people in the shop was all because we didn't have a lot of electronic equipment at that time. And two transmitter engineers. Um, news had about, well, about two-thirds of what they have for a staff now. So we've gone from eight master control operators to one because we're, we're hubbed, uh, we're monitored out of Spartanburg and uh, with, with Nexstar, big hub out there. Uh, but lots of changes in people. And, it, and equipment, beside the point, the, the people side and the, the job side, what, having all of those people at that time, did it make of a, of a, did it make more of a challenge to get everybody on the same page to get the news done at, at whatever time? Did it heighten the stress level when there's more people, or is it more stressful now with only two people doing a, a newscast? Um, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I, you had more stress because film took longer to process, film breaks, um, and the equipment wasn't as reliable, I suppose, because there was more. It was more mechanical at that point in time, and especially, I mean, from my perspective in master control, it was more stressful because you had two reels that were um, getting rolled, and and you had to make sure that they were in the right place. You, the master control operator, wasn't doing that. That was actually done out of studio control. They were, they were rolling the film. Um, but then you had to make sure that the commercials were in the right places, and you had more breaks during news. But we ran, we had a lot less news then. I, I was trying to remember after you guys were talking about coming over and, and interviewing me. I don't think we did a morning show um, at all. I think we had some cut-ins early on in today's show, and then we had 15 minutes at noon of a noon news, and then we had 15 minutes of floppy, and we had floppy at. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon and then we went syndicated and we had um, we had a six and we had a ten but now we're doing 42 hours 43 hours a week uh, there's a lot more news being produced a lot a lot more local time what was the engineering shop like in the beginning um, those who had to repair everything because you've you've mentioned a lot of points where something could break you mentioned film could break or a playback machine or a chain gets out of sync yeah and you know the the equipment in master control there there were even some tube things uh, in the very very early time when I started in in 78 um, took more adjustment but um, more mechanical things the tape machines but we didn't have the ENG equipment that we do now. So um, in, the, in the mid years between, say, 1980 and 1999, we had a dozen cameras that were going out on the street or more, and each of those had a deck in them or, the, or a deck, uh, tape deck that you carried alongside. And all of the editing was done on tape decks, BVU 200s. Um, in each of the edit bay, two of them. And so there was a lot of mechanical work to be done at that point, a lot of, lot of very meticulous setup 
And I didn't get in on a lot of that. We had people, uh, Lyle Shires did most of it, uh, most of the mechanical work and most of the um, uh, preventative maintenance on the, on the decks. Uh, did some and we and the tape machines that we were running the ACR playing commercials off from that was mostly mechanical mechanical pneumatic did a lot of repair on that um, a lot of sound uh, 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 troubleshooting what sound did that make what what did it do um, so because you didn't have the internet to Google to see what the didn't, what didn't the problem have the internet um, we were in this building, and I don't remember the year, but our, uh, when we moved over here, and even in the old uh, uh, station, almost everything was hand-typed on paper. Traffic, sales, we'd get a handwritten log, or a hand-typed log, and we'd have to hand-sign it. Um, when the first computers that we had in the building were on the business side, uh, little uh, PDP-14, I think, is a, a little mini computer, um, and then AS-400s and System 38s on the business side. And we finally, uh, Dennis Long and I, put in a um, an ARCnet uh, network in the building. We ran off from 62-ohm coax. Uh, and that was our first foray into networking, a little... Um, you know, probably had 10 computers hooked to it. The uh, first computer on the news production side was an Apple, I think it was a 2E in weather. And Mike Lozano uh, was the first um, computer whiz on weather equipment. And it, that was in the old building, and it sat in the studio. Um, that was quite the deal. It had computer graphics for a um, change. And not just writing on the screen backwards. Not just writing. They, we never did, <laughs> at least in my time, we never wrote on the screen backwards. That was a Connie McBurney thing and, and her predecessor. Um, uh, can't say the gentleman's name right now. Um, but whoever was Connie's predecessor pioneered that writing on the screen backwards thing. Do you enjoy, I've always thought of you, Brad, as a guy who loves to create something out of the, the, basically thin air. When you're talking about building the first network computer thing to what you've built here technically to be able to exchange video uh, between stations, why has that always attracted uh, your side of your brain to, to keep you ticking? Um, challenge, uh, doing something that somebody else hasn't done or doing it differently than somebody else has done. We had um, we had the first live truck in the market, and it was built by the AM transmitter guys in secret out at Mitchellville. And we, it had to be built very low because the garage out there was, didn't have a tall door in it. In fact, when we moved into this building, uh, the, build, the door downstairs isn't very tall, so we had to have one of our engineers, who's a mechanical genius, uh, built the first pan tilt head on top of that so that it would fit in the door downstairs. So doing stuff with my hands and, and being first has always intrigued me. We had, um, we put up the uh, receive site up on top of Ruan, crawled up around in the bowels of Ruan for years, still have receive site up there. We, um, we did one of the first live helicopter feeds in the uh, um, market. We had Ruan Grand Prix was in town and floods of 93 comes through. And we had a helicopter, but we didn't have any way to get the signal back. So I uh, jury rigged a small, what we called a coffee can antenna on the end of a pole and hung that out the window of the helicopter and kept that pointed at the Ruan receive site while we toured down around downtown and Jim Strickland's famous quote uh, from the uh, people playing in the floodwaters down below. And that was how we got the first helicopter stuff on the air. 1993. 93. Uh, we'll get to the, back to the helicopter in a moment because that's one of those technological things that's always kind of fun. Uh, building a live truck in secret, I'd never heard that story before. You didn't want Channel 8 to know. Didn't want Channel 8 to know. Um, and that, that was about in the 79 region, I think, 79, 80, because... We built that, and we had the original link from Ruan down to 1100 Walnut on the roof of 1100 Walnut and um, 
a dish up on top of Ruan to link that down. Um, but they built the truck out there, in, like I said, in secret, uh, all hand constructed, all, all the interior work. And then um, we, at that point in time, Bob Harder was the uh, GM, uh, uh, president of Palmer probably at that point, and he was tight with John Ruan. John Ruan won. And they did a deal, probably out at Wakanda over, you know, cigars or something. And um, we got permission to put the receive site up there and uh, kind of a sweetheart deal went for years and years and years. We didn't pay a lot of money for it. That's changed a little bit, but um, um, we did the install ourselves, so we didn't have to involve any contractors. And I, again, I don't remember the date or the, the time, but yeah, we put the first live truck on the air in the market. Did microwave technology and the ability to do live trucks, did that change the news game when that technology came around? Uh, allowed you to cover more stories? Cover more stories, cover more stories um, more immediately. Fires, uh, you know, anything big where you wanted to be out. And then at, in the uh, early 80s, we put up the receive site up on the top of the tower at Alleman. So that gave us a huge range. We can get from Highway 3 up on the north, we have gotten, I don't know, you know, depends on the day, but we have gotten from as, as far north as Highway 3, as far south as uh, um, almost the Missouri border. If, mm. you find a, if you find a high spot, the fact that we've, our receive sites at 1,800 feet means a lot. Um, so we, we get a lot of range out of that. We've been able to go up to Fort Dodge and do uh, girls softball coverage live. We've gone down to, we've gone over to Marshalltown back when the boys state baseball was over there and we put up a, uh, we put up a transmit antenna on top of the water tower in Marshalltown. We did Pella Tulip Festival, uh, had shows down there for a number of years and we would carry portable microwave up to the top of the grain elevator and we'd do a double hop from um, a double hop, well, really? Yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd microwave from the square, from the bank, back in the bank parking lot uh, in Pella, up to the top of the grain elevator and from the grain elevator back to here. And that, you know, that, that's another, like you say, that's another thing that uh, makes it fun for me, doing something like that that is a little out of the ordinary and it accomplishes something that nobody else has been able to do. So live trucks change whether a it wasn't your station, but a guy at your station now. Maybe if they drive a live truck under a bridge and shear off the top. It's a great Keith Murphy story at another time. But that he wasn't here at the time when he did No, it. but we, we had our share of that. We lost one underneath the canopy of the, um, of the Gateway Hotel up in Ames. And we lost many of them either in the garage downstairs or in the garage out out here that we put the trucks in, um, people were in a hurry and they would run out there to go on breaking news and they would punch the up button on the door and then get in the truck and take off. Well, the door wasn't all the way up yet, uh, so the mast would catch and we'd lose the bottom section of the door and the, the pan tilt heads that we used at the time seemed to have a breakaway section on them. It was a cast piece of aluminum and it would break off. And the reason I, I'm fairly certain that that was meant to be that way is because inside that was a piece of uh, 3 8 inch steel aircraft cable. And so when the mast would break off, it wouldn't fall on the ground, it would stay up at the top, it would, it would be there. But it was about a I don't know, it was probably a, a good, better part of a day to put a new pan tilt head on the mast. Uh, and we've done that many times, many times. And a few news directors or assignment editors were yelling at you, how much longer? And you're like, well, if you wouldn't have broken it, I wouldn't have to be well, here there's fixing always, it. Well, there's always that. <laughs> uh, there's always that. Uh, uh, the technology uh, now, then moves to satellite. Mm -hmm. And w there was a race again with KCCI on who has the first satellite truck. Yep. How did that 
change and, and why did that technology come around? Well, um, satellite went from strictly a C-band signal where the uplinks were huge. You had to have dishes that were the, the size of houses. Um, Iowa Public's got a seven meter dish out there that they uplink C-band stuff or at least used to on. Um, and that wasn't feasible for the most part on trucks, although networks and certain sports organizations would do that. They'd have a, they'd have a dish on top of a truck a big straight truck that would fold out or on the back of a semi mm -hmm. that would fold out so you would get the dish size and still be able to transport it down the road. But then um, satellites started shifting to what they call KU band which is a higher frequency so needed a smaller dish. And that made it more feasible and more cost effective for local stations to have their own satellite truck. We purchased a satellite truck and I think it was I want to say 96 somewhere between 93 and, and 96 anyway um, from Harris broadcast at that time uh, it was built in Cincinnati I believe and it was exhibited on the floor out at NAB we got a little bit of a price break I guess for doing that and then it got driven from uh, Las Vegas back to here and boom we were on the air with a big satellite truck. Now at that point it was still a big straight truck and it had air brakes so you had to have a different driver's license for that. You had to have at least a class B CDL with air brake certification and um, over the years I think we had half a dozen different drivers for that just you know they'd come and go um, and uh, then Eventually, the technology got to the point where you could do that with smaller and smaller dishes and smaller and smaller trucks. And now you do that off the top of a regular E350 or whatever live van. Do you even have the satellite truck anymore? No, we sold the satellite sold truck it. to somebody in Texas um, shortly after we got uh, a combo truck on a van. And uh, that went away, and that was a good thing because A, it took up way too much room it was you needed to have special license now anybody can drive it uh, photogs uh, photojournalists um, are certified to take the truck out and we do we do uh, recertification every two years from safety safety training standpoint and you were in the market at the time when uh, somebody put a satellite or a, a live truck mast into the power lines uh, when you mentioned safety when you heard that had happened that day What's the first thought you have from an engineering standpoint of, oh boy, I better make sure, A, they're okay, but B, then, yeah, are our people Yeah, obviously prepared? the first thing you are concerned about them, and you want to figure out how that happened, and then, from, like you said, from an engineering standpoint, what can we do both on the personnel side and from an equipment side to try and keep that from happening again? Um, it, as a pragmatist, I know that you can never prevent everything from ever happening again, contrary to what some people want. But um, you, there are alarms that are made, and we made sure that we purchased and installed those alarms, or they sense high voltage, and um, well, they sense current. But they, um, so when you get to a location, as you run the mast up, the alarm will sound. Um, and then it, it's a training thing. Uh, make sure that the first thing that you do is check the location. Above all else, make sure that you have a safe location. Um, I don't care if you have to string 500 feet of cable. I don't care if you don't get the shot. But make sure that you look up. We have lights. We have spotlights that you know shine up. The sad part of this was is it was a bright and sunny day and there were no clouds and there was a pole this big around about 50 feet right in front of that truck and it shouldn't have happened but it did so you you try and mitigate that um, that risk as best you can equipment wise let's go back to the helicopter that okay. was a that was a fun 
Was it fun? Oh, it was to a blast. have a helicopter it, chopper thirteen. Yeah, um, that was another one of those secret missions. We I think we had a had a code name for the project. I don't remember what it was anymore, but. Um, that was, uh, we convinced the New York Times that it was something that was important for uh, news gathering. And uh, we rented a uh, Robinson R44 from a gentleman down in Texas who does this for TV stations. And with that, we rented the pilot, Captain Darren Raleigh, Captain Darren, <coughs> who's still to the best of my knowledge, still lives in Ankeny, and he flies um, air ambulance out of Mason City, I believe. Um, and Darren was a great guy, and I had the opportunity to learn how to be the backseat guy in the chopper, and spent a lot of time going up and doing stuff in the in the helicopter. Because you would, the pilot couldn't be operating the camera. Well, in a lot of markets they do, but it's not really safe and uh, it, it, it's bad enough that the pilot was the, was the on-air voice, um, but at least he wasn't manning the camera and uh, dividing his attention um, that way. So you would have a second person, like you said, in the back seat running the camera, and, mm -hmm. and you were sending many times signal back live via microwave. Yep. And that helped again with whether you're at Alamin or Ruan, trying to hit the yep. one of the two. Yeah, and the, the, the nice part about as you move into the modern age of helicopters, you don't have to stick a pole out the window and aim the antenna. That's all handled automatically uh, via GPS coordinates. The helicopter knows where it is and the gimbal or in the, uh, the microwave dish knows where the receive site is and it keeps pointed that way as best it can. And how long was the is Chopper 13 here? <sighs> I, I'm going to guess maybe three years, four years? I think three or four years, and then uh, the, we, had, we had three different um, eras of Chopper 13. We had the original R44 with Darren, and then um, corporately and insurance-wise, it was deemed that um, the, the R44 at the time was a piston uh, engine aircraft and piston engine helicopters were frowned upon by insurance companies. So it finally got to the point where the insurance company and corporate wouldn't allow us to fly that anymore. So that version of Chopper 13 went away and then we moved to a Bell 206 Jet Ranger, um, a turbine powered aircraft and bigger and faster and more powerful um, and we had to change pilots at that point. Uh, Fred Redmond was our pilot and he lived down by Winterset. I haven't kept up with Fred. I don't know where he's at but hopefully he's still flying somewhere and living down by Winterset. So we had that for a number of years and then the cost was just too great. Um, you, with any business, you have to decide on people or equipment, and um, people were more important. So we got rid of that deal, and then for a short amount of time after that, we contracted with a company out of Ankeny. Um, John McLaughlin was a part owner in that company, a weather guy over at uh, Channel 8. And um, we contracted with them, and we were back to an R44 at that time, Robinson R44 at that time. And I don't know that that lasted more than a year, and that just sort of went away as well. I never really had the opportunity to fly with them. Um, I trusted Darren. I trusted Fred, both of those guys with my life. The situation wasn't quite the same with the group out of Ankeny, and I... I um, kind of gave up on that after a time. You chose life over the, uh, the, 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 yeah. the, the story. Yeah. Uh, I, I, do have, I do have one distinction, though. I am the um, only helicopter cameraman in the Des Moines market to actually do a car chase. We, act, we were up one day for traffic in the afternoon, and... Uh, there was a car chase going on and we heard it on the scanners and we followed this car through just north of 
uh, downtown here until it ended. So I'm, I've got the only car chase in Des Moines. You were ready to go work KTLA yeah. or something yeah. in Los Angeles. Slow speed chase in LA. Yeah. Now, there you go. Uh, the technology, I guess, let's stick on getting signals onto the air. Now, live trucks, satellite trucks, helicopters, goes to the phone. When did the first battery or a, a multi, I call it cell backpack or, yep. or that type of technology, when, do you remember when that came about and how that changed things? Well, that, that happened for us during the time that um, probably that local TV, or at least in the transition between local TV and Tribune did. Um, we had a corporate engineer by the name of Hank Hundemer, who was very forward-thinking, very forward-looking uh, gentleman, and um, that was one of his uh, directives for all of the stations in the group was to make sure that we were on the forefront of the um, on, of the cell stuff. And we first put on the air uh, equipment from a company called Teradec, and I think we still have one that's functional right now. We've kind of scavenged the other one for other things. Um, but from Teradec, we went to Degeros, and now we've got six Degeros, and the one Teradec's still operational. So uh, several of the journalists carry them all the time, and then we've got a couple for checkout basis. And the uh, a, a little dig at Randy here, but uh, photojournalists love them because they carry this little pack, and they've got 10 feet of cable, and they don't have to string 200 feet of cable and be tied to a truck, and they don't have to drag the truck out. Um, but the, the caveat to that, as, as an old-time engineer, as a, as, a, um, as a curmudgeon, says that uh, when you have a disaster, as, as you have with hurricanes in Florida and Louisiana, and you've got tornadoes through here and ice storms and, and derechos, um, one of the first things that goes is the cell service. And once the cell service goes, you're out of luck. And if you go to, we've had several instances where you go to big events um, where you may not have enough cell service available. Uh, you can get there and especially out in the, in the boonies, um, if you've got two or three news people trying to use, each one of those boxes has anywhere from four to six um, cell cards in it. So you're using four to six channels of that, of the, and then if you've got two or three news organizations there, that mounts up pretty quickly. And if you're out in the, like I said, out in the boonies, you may not have that available, and you may not get as good a resolution. You may not get, you may have a lot more latency, or you may not get anything at all, or you may get right up to airtime, and somebody turns something on, and boom, you're done. So you, reliance on somebody else is not necessarily always good. You mentioned Hank, and Hank's stories are legendary to me in the change, just in the time that I haven't been here and how things have. Hank also came up with, I believe, didn't he, or the ability to file transfer news stories among organizations as opposed to using the satellite uplink to get a story when, from one place to another? When, um, when we were sold by New York Times to local TV, um, it was, uh, it was an interesting time because uh, Hank was not a guy to pay um, manufacturers um, service fees. You know, every year you gotta pay me $6,000 just for the privilege of owning my equipment. And he invented, he's actually got some patents on the equipment that we moved to. So instead of buying something from Panasonic or Sony or um, Avid or whoever, he would hire some software coders and they would decide what features they needed and they would invent it and build it themselves. And not only were they doing that on the software side, they were basing this on off-the-shelf desktop PCs. So where we went from a server, we, we went server uh, for news play out and in master control in, 
the late 90s under the New York Times. We stopped playing tape. We haven't played tape to air unless it's an emergency since 1999 in this building. Um, another big transition. But then when local TV bought us, we switched server systems to something that they designed and built. And with a lot of trepidation going in on my part, again, I like something that works. I like to be able to call somebody. But the Hank stuff, the Hankware as we called it, worked. And it was simple and it was maintainable. And I could get up at three o'clock in the morning and I could dial in from home and I could usually fix something there. So in a that happened in Master Control, the system called Brutus. That happened in the news playout um, arena with something called Tops, the other playout system, Tops. And then uh, from a newsroom computer system, we had Opus. And then at the very end of the Hank era, we, for the graphics, we went to something called Flight. And it was all based on the same code. I mean, you're just playing video, and, and the, the person that wrote this was a video game coder, I guess, in um, their uh, first life. So um, it, it was with a lot of anguish that we did that, but Hank pushed us into this age, and uh, um, after we were purchased by Nexstar, uh, most of the systems went back the other direction to vendor-based systems. And um, there's uh, some yearning for going back the other way. The curmudgeon was right in a few instances is what you're trying to tell me? Maybe. A little, yeah. here and there. Uh, uh, Brad, when, before we started rolling, you were, we were talking about the State Fair mm -hmm. and, and covering. Um, do you yearn for those days? Well, I guess tell me how you would get a signal from the fairgrounds down uh, to downtown or out to Ireland. The, fir the first time in the modern age that we went back out and did live shows at the fair, we were doing it off the porch of the administration building. And, and this is what year, do you think? I would say probably 79 or 80. Okay. Um, I'd have to go back and look, but it had to be in that era because it was before we moved to this building, so it was prior to 82, and we did it for two or three years, so 79 or 80. And to get the signal to hear, um, we strung, had, had constructed a cable TV coax from the administration building through the trees, over the top of the ag building, up the hill to the top of what's now the cultural center, which at the time was the girls' dorm. Funny story there, too. Um, so, and then that was the transmit end, and the, the equipment was huge. There was a six-foot rack, weighed several hundred pounds, a four-foot uh, big dish that we put up on top of that building. And then on the receive side, since we were down at 1100 Walnut, kind of in a hole with a, with a two-story building, we put a receive antenna and another huge rack of equipment up in the uh, elevator penthouse at the Hotel Fort Des Moines and strung another coax down the fire escape and through the back alley across the street to 1100 Walnut. Um, and we did that ourselves. We, had a, we have a green monster, we call it. It's a crank up lift that one person can stand on. And we were pulling that through the alley, uh, attaching to telephone poles across the street, this coax to get to 1100. Um, and then, um, so one night, and we, we would do, we would do noon out there, we would do the floppy show, we would do the six and we would do the 10 off the porch out there. And we had lights strung up um, back in the days when it was all incandescent lighting and it was hot and it was uh, a lot of power. We had a power box that we had installed on the side of the building out there just for us. So one night, somewhere 9, 9.30, um, they didn't have a signal. And, this, and the microwave equipment that we were using was probably from the 60s at that point. Uh, old, decrepit, tube-based stuff. And we needed to go up and power cycle or, or check, anyway, the transmitter up on the girls' dorm. And this was after 9 o'clock in the middle of the night when it was the girls' dorm, uh, where, the, where the girls from 4-H and FFA stayed. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, literally, no man's land. And we were trying to get in, Bill Brown and I, 
were trying to get into that building and go up on the roof and we got uh, accosted by the the dorm mother or whatever her name was and what are you doing here you need to get out of here i'm calling the police um, no, you don't understand. We need to do this. We need to get up on the roof of this building. Um, so we finally got up there and we got it reset and we had the show on the air. You've mentioned some good stories. What ones stand out that you tell? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the flood. What do you remember? What was the most impactful other than the... Well, the, the, from my perspective, the, the best, my best time during the flood um, obviously lots of people lost water. You couldn't get from point A to point B. Um, in addition to the helicopter story, um, the uh, waterworks went under water, so we lost water. But in the midst of all of that, the uh, two substations, two downtown substations, one down here south of Meredith and the other one over on the river, excuse me, both went under water. And so there is no power downtown and isn't going to be for a while until the water's come down, they can clean all that equipment. We have a small generator in the basement and it's enough to keep us on the air, but just that, no lights. Uh, so we were kind of scrambling and then you know, I'm laying at home in bed at four o'clock in the morning and the generator in the basement is water cooled and it's water cooled with just tap water coming in. So the water comes in, goes through the generator to cool it, and then it goes into the drain. And at four o'clock in the morning, I hear on the news, because we're on the air, everybody's on the air, I hear that the waterworks is gonna go underwater and the city's gonna lose water. Well, we lose water, we lose generator, we lose power, we're done. Um, so called chief engineer, and he's working on one solution. The chief engineer at the time was Vic Landau, uh, my predecessor, and he's working on one solution and I've, it was Ruin Grand Prix was in town. There's generators, portable generators sitting all over downtown. And I know that Baker Electric, our electrician of choice, installed a lot of those generators. So my neighbor, good friend of mine, uh, Mike Comer, uh, called him, said, Mike, I got a problem. And he called uh, a gentleman by the name of Larry Enga at Baker and said, WHO needs a generator. So Larry went down, hooked on to a generator with his truck, disconnected it from whatever it was connected to for the Grand Prix, drug it down here, um, hot wired into the transformer out, out front here, totally illegally. Power, power company owns the transformer, power company was, would have gone ballistic if they'd have known it. And when they did find out, they went ballistic. Um, but we were on the air and nobody else was. And I, the story that I heard was that we had like a 93 share that morning that the waterworks went under because Channel 8 didn't have a generator at all. And they, they had their chief engineer, Bill Huey, at the time when they built their new building, had decided that we're going to bring a power feed in from this substation, we'll bring another power feed in from this substation. Both substations certainly will never go off the line at the same time. So that, that's, those are the kind of things that, um, that kind of drive my enjoyment and my because passion. Because we've had news people say it's so important, we have to get the story. You are that part of get the story out, because if they have the story, there's no way to get it to the next level. That's where you have come in to save the day. And, li and literally I'm, I'm, save the day. At times, yeah, at times. And, and I've, you know, I can't take any credit for this myself. I've got wonderful people that work in my department. Um, I kind of shepherd them around a little bit, and I, I sometimes will ask the right questions to get answers out of them that maybe they weren't thinking of and especially in the last 10 years um, 20 years um, it, it's it's going to be a sea change in this industry um, channel 8's already gone through it with the retirement of all but one of their old-time engineers they've got one person over there that's been more than there more than five years I believe uh, channel 5 is is in the process of going through it they've got one person there that's been there uh, Dennis Poffenberger's been there for 
30 plus years and he's close to retirement. Um, I'm 66 and all of the people in my department are over 60 or real close to it anyway. Um, so, and, it, and it's, it's endemic in the industry. Um, people don't want to be broadcast engineers anymore. Um, nobody, you can find a lot of computer people out there and, and really 75, 80% of what we do anymore is computer related, but finding a person that wants to be on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, 52 weeks out of the year, um, is hard to do. Somebody who wants to work nights, somebody who wants to come in on, you know, on weekends or do, do big installs, that's hard to find. Uh, hard to find. How much longer does Brad Oak stay? Don't know. What has kept you staying? Well, you know, everybody needs a paycheck. Um, but there, there's always challenges and um, ATSC3 is coming along and that's a challenge. Uh, it will involve a new transmitter, possibly a new antenna, and the mechanical parts of that intrigue me and, and being able to put a huge project like that together. Um, I've been involved with two transmitter installs um, on the north site and then the, uh, did, or the uh, solid state one at the south site. And um, I think, you know, four different automation systems and uh, three, four, five different tape systems um, and uh, going from analog to digital and high def. We were kind of the pioneer in the market on that. I, Iowa Public made it on the air first, but we had the first, um, you know, news content that was in high def and that was a lot of fun. Uh, what was a bigger transition, do you think, film to tape or standard def to HD? Um, probably um, standard def to HD, uh, film to tape, that was a gradual transition. There were um, three or four years down at the old building where we were still processing our own film, but adding ENG equipment and then when we moved here, got rid of the film chains had gone away just prior to that. and. So that was more of a gradual change, but standard F to HD, that, was, that, that really had to be an overnight change. So, uh, Speaking of overnights, what's the strangest phone call other than you laying in bed watching the we're gonna lose water? Oh, strangest phone call. I mean, you mentioned uh, you know, live trucks having sheared off or... Yeah, um, wow. I, I don't know. It, it runs together. I mean, I still got I still get calls. I got a call from um, one of the directors two weeks ago at 2:45. Hey, I get this alarm going off. Oh, okay, thanks. I'll take care of it. Or we don't have the DOT cameras are down today. So, so well, you know, not much I can do about it. It's a DOT issue. Um, but strange, I don't know. That that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, anything odd in the building, uh, animal-wise? Uh, I know that uh, there's been, you know, little rodents or anything like that. Do you ever have any, like, you mentioned Floppy. That's not a rodent, of course. That was no, a, that, was that was a dog. A dog. Was a dog uh, but, I mean, did you, I mean, like when people come in for the noon show and they bring pets or whatever, did you, we, any of those? We have about? had um, larger animals in the building, and we've had dogs uh, do their thing in the hallway. Um, but that's... That's news. Um, <laughs> the, it, the, the biggest thing that we've had in the building, um, between um, 1982 when we moved in and just within, well, just this last eight years, we have had every presidential, every president has been in the building. Um, the Reagan visit was, was interesting in that uh, we've got a big garage door in the in the large studio, and at that time the big studio wasn't being used for anything, wasn't being used for news. So Secret Service came in, they did their survey, and 
they decided that the president's limousine would drive into, into the building, into the studio. But the limo was heavy enough that they were worried about the floor, so they brought in bridge plank and laid down on the floor in the studio where the car would drive in uh, to spread the load out. So they, Reagan arrived. He came in, drove in, he got out of the car, went into the little studio, they shut the doors. The uh, driver backed the car out, turned it around, and backed in so that he was going to make a quick getaway. Um, and in and out, I've got a picture standing beside the limo in the, in the big studio. Um, but because of our association with WHO Radio and their reach, when they were in the building, and, and our caucus coverage and, our, and being TV station in Des Moines. We have had every president, every president in the building with the exception of President Biden. Um, we had, uh, during caucus period, we had um, interviews with uh, President Obama. Uh, he used my office as his green room when he was here. Um, and uh, everybody in between. It was kind of fun. Well, when radio was here, we haven't really talked about that, but you didn't have much to do with radio, but you did get to know them. What was it like to have a mega media? I mean, you had, I think, five radio stations plus your TV station. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in this building. A lot going on. Um, our, our relationship with radio was really always very good. I mean, we were, we were owned by the same people up till 96 when we got sold to the Times and radio got sold to J-Corps. Um, and then they stayed on as, as tenants, uh, and you, the radio experience um, was mostly good, except having tenants, no matter who they are, is always a problem, especially um, engineering, chief engineer is, is typically responsible for the building and the grounds as well. So if it's too hot, if it's too cold, if the lights are burned out, if the toilet's plugged, that's the calls that I get. Um, and the chief engineers everywhere get it's not just me um, but uh, we had good relationships uh, news departments worked together and we continued to work together with them when they moved up the street uh, had uh, you know pretty much positive all all the time they it got to be crowded at the end uh, they had two three people to a cubicle and they had when we moved into the building in 82, they had WHO AM, and then they had the FM, which at the time was an automated station and just had a big jukebox of elevator music. And uh, But then they expanded and changed and had lots of people. Uh, things have changed when you say number of stations. Even you now with 13.1, .2, .3, and you have .4. Yep. How has that made your life go well um, initially it, it it's it's not an incremental um, workload we still have to monitor them um, right now 13.1 main channel NBC affiliate news 13.2 at this point in time is rewind TV and dot three is antenna TV and dot four is court TV um, when we first put the uh, digital on the air, we had dot two, we had a weather channel. And it, it was kind of a weather jukebox in that the weather people would cut a couple of uh, clips and those would go into the automation and they would uh, play at certain times and then the weather computer would play backgrounds the rest of the time and we would go to commercials and we would have some other programming in there as well. Um, some background music <coughs> and um, but then antenna TV court TV and and rewind they all come in on satellite we do insert commercials in antenna but we don't in court and rewind at this point they're just pass through we do IDs and we do EAS test um, for legality stake there um, hopefully we'll get back a weather channel at some point there um, I had a farmer tell me this fall how much he missed this 13.2. Well, it, it's, it was important to us from a brand, and there are a lot of people. I miss it myself. I miss being able to turn on the TV at 3 o'clock in the morning and see <laughs> what's going on. Yeah. Um, and I said, hopefully we'll get that brand back.
at some point. All right, Brad, any other thing that you thought I would cover that you want to get out there one last chance? Um, no, I, I, you know, engineering tends to be a service organization and we have lots of clients in the building and we have a few clients outside of the building as well. I take a lot of phone calls from viewers who, I can't get you anymore, I used to, um, but that's part of the business. Um, I, I was named chief engineer in October of 93 when my predecessor decided he was going to move to Florida. And uh, I like to tell people that uh, Joe Lentz, the uh, um, general manager at the time who promoted me, said, I'm doing this against my better judgment. I don't think you'll last. So thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. But I've had to, I've had to um, temper my uh, emotions a lot. Um, but I, but the, the key is you have to be able to work with everybody in the building. You have to be able to especially work with the news department and the news director. You have to be able to work with the sales department, production department, uh, because really you are um, a service organization to them. So um, um, the big changes, finding engineers, um, that's it. I always enjoyed my time sheepishly coming to Brad Oak. I think we broke something. <laughs> that was always a, always a, always a question or always a need. Uh, Brad Oak, Chief Engineer, WHO TV 13, Des Moines, Iowa. My thanks to Cliff Brockman, our producer today, Randy Schumacher on camera, and then a huge thanks to WHO TV uh, for allowing us to use their old radio studios here uh, for this uh, Archives of Iowa Broadcasting Oral History on December 19th, 2022. Brad Oak, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate. Uh, be interesting to watch. <laughs>